Dean Johnson, and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I'd like to welcome all of you to a very special talk with one of our history-making faculty members, Kevin McCartney. We've been very privileged as a campus to host many speakers over the years, from astronauts and journalists to some of our faculty members who have published important works. But I have to say that this is the first time we've hosted a Fulbright speaker who happens to serve as a faculty member on this very campus. It was 2016 when Kevin shared the big news with us that he'd been awarded a Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program grant, and that was a big wow moment for us as a campus. Kevin is Northern Maine's first ever Fulbright Scholar, and this is an achievement to be applauded. So. Last academic year, he spent nearly nine months in Stetschen, Poland, and during his trip, he undertook two large and several smaller studies connected to his research in the field of micropaleontology, delivered presentations in several Polish cities, taught a geology course, assisted students and faculty colleagues in writing English language papers and grant proposals, and even named a new species in honor of his benefactor, U.S. Senator William Fulbright. And he's named a few other species in honor of Humpy, actually. Quite a few species, actually. And as Kevin always does, he stayed busy with many other projects and activities, attending weekly meetings at the local English-speaking Rotary Club, helping to establish an International Planet Head Day event in Poland, which is coming up soon, and of course, meeting fellow antique iron collectors. Kevin is going to share with us details and stories about the research he conducted and the adventures he had during his Fulbright year in Poland. We are incredibly proud of the work Kevin has been able to accomplish during his Fulbright, how he has been a wonderful ambassador for UMPI, Maine and the United States, I might add, at the international level, and we look forward to hearing more about it tonight. With that, let us begin. Again, welcome to tonight's talk, and thank you for being a part of this very special presentation. Please join me in giving Kevin a warm welcome. Yeah! Decisions for Fulbrights are made 
in the foreign country. So you apply here and the, the American uh, reviewers pick out the ones they want to send on. And then the, the foreign countries decide who's going to make the trip one way or another. And they do that on the basis of, of, who, of their own self-interest, who's going to best serve their country. Most Fulbrights come from the foreign country to here. Some Fulbrights come from here to the foreign country. What I saw in my experience, of course, is from Poland, um, the year that I was there, there were about 30 just recently graduated um, four-year students who were had a Fulbright going to Poland to help teach um, English language skills in various and sundry programs, schools, whatever, in Poland. And that is something that was a little bit of a surprise for me. I never really got much chance to talk to any of these students. None of them came to my, were doing their work in, in my city, Szczecin. Uh, but it's something we can work on. And as I said to various of you um, in the last hour, this is, I'm the first Fulbright here from this university from Northern Maine, but this is something that's doable for any number of you. And we need to start working on those connections so that, so that we can segue into this. So, where I went was the University of Szczecin, uh, which is up in the northwestern corner of the country. Szczecin has a, a population of about 400,000, so it's a lot larger than Presque Isle. But I, the region and really sort of the philosophy of the city itself is very much like Presque Isle and Rooster County. It is at pretty much the end of the road, uh, very close to a foreign country, uh, about, about a two and a half hour drive southwest of there you'd be in Berlin. And it's, uh, it's, um, I'm not sure what I was going to say now, but anyway, uh, it, it, I always felt at home. I never had a bad experience, and it is a lot like here. And I will say this from the get-go, from my time in Poland, I love the place as I love here for a lot of the same reasons. Now, while I was in uh, Szczecin, I did do a little exploring to some of the cities in northern Poland. I went to Warszawa, which is what we would call Warsaw, and Turun as um, Fulbright, on Fulbright trips. And then uh, my wife Kate came and joined me. We went to Poznań, and we also on another trip went to Warszawa and Gdansk. We'll see some pictures of some of those. I won't be able to show as many pictures as I, as I want. I want to spend about 55 minutes, maybe an hour, and then we can have some questions and answers and, and talk about more of this. But to begin with, I really need to talk about what brought me there. And uh, this is my office. Uh, this is, uh, my wife would tell you that I must have just gotten into the office because it doesn't have all the litter around it. And that would be the truth. Uh, but let me, let me talk about what I did there. Uh, I basically, I'm at my microscope, I've got a computer, I'm ready to take some notes and so forth. And that's what I did for probably 10 to 11 or more hours each day. I would get up, eat some breakfast, I'd take the tram to the office, arriving there at maybe 9 o'clock, and I would work all day here, maybe a little bit of time, somewhere along the way, to interact with some colleagues in the geology and oceanography programs. And at the end of the day, I would um, turn out the scope, put on a light jacket, it never got very cold there, and I'd go around the corner to a pub and I'd drink beer. <laughs> and, and that's what I did. You know, people ask, what did you do in Poland? This is what I did day in, day out, for weeks at a time without break, and then every once in a while, I'd get an opportunity to do a little bit of looking around. But I am here to do science. And, and what I'm doing here is I am filling my childhood fantasies. You know, you, you, want to, you want to learn science, you love science, but as a child, I wanted to take that a step further. I wanted to be doing science, and I am doing science. And um, I am 
getting a new appreciation with almost every day, the, the field of my study, the silicoflagellates, and, and I'm also uh, uh, developing a new appreciation for beer. Um, <laughs> the beer there is very good. We just finished the uh, Super Bowl here, and I can tell you that that beer is infinitely better than any beer that was advertised during the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, so, I spend a lot of time uh, talking to uh, people in the community here, and uh, as a spokesperson for, for science in various capacities, I get a lot of questions about matters of science, and they tend to take one of three flavors, um, what's the current status of Pluto, uh, what's the, uh, this rock that I just found in my backyard, or what's going on with climate change. And what I'd like to do here is, I do have a general audience, I want to talk about my science, but I do not want to get too overly detailed because if I did, I'd probably, it, 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 it'd be trivia to you, I think. I want to talk a little bit about my science, but I also want to talk about how that relates to the broader picture. And so we'll start there. I get this question all the time, and I answer the question, depending on my audience and how, how long they're willing to listen, I answer it in about three different levels. And the first level is this. Of course the climate is changing, because we have an extremely active planet, and everything is changing all the time. Even the position of North America is changing by about that much each year, which is no trivial amount. So about climate, it's either right now getting warmer or it's getting colder. It cannot possibly be staying the same. It's the nature of our planet. But let's go ahead and take a look at that record. And this shows half a billion, 500 million years worth of history. And if you were, and I'm going to move around so people can get a a, a, a different view of me and standing in front of this. I don't want to obscure your views. But you can see that there were times when things were a lot warmer, times when things were a lot colder. There have been numerous times when we had glacial periods, including the very recent past when we had ice ages. 100 million years ago, it was hot enough that Probably you would have been hard pressed being there to find snow anywhere, anytime during the year. And I mean to say, in Antarctica, and Antarctica then was about where it is now. Antarctica had quite a diversity of life, uh, quite a challenge for figuring out how they, how they did it, being dark six months out of the year. Uh, but there was no snow there. So, what happened in the time since then? If you look at this, part of the curve, from something near 100 million years ago, we've seen a, a cooling. And I think the first question is, how did that cooling happen? Is there an explanation for that? And there is. And it is ocean current systems. And I can be more specific than that. If we were to study the oceans, as oceanographers do, oceanographers will tell you that there are five oceans in the world today. So let's count them on our fingers. There is the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, that's four. The remaining one is the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Ocean doesn't jump out at us because, because the ocean is largely not bounded by, by other continents. It's bounded by the south, to the south by Antarctica, but to the north, it's bounded by a ocean current. The, Antarctic Convergence. And that Antarctic Convergence has only manifested itself in the, last, in the last few tens of millions of years. And what happened was that Australia used to at one time be connected with Antarctica, and it's now been, we don't like to use the word drifting, but it's an appropriate word, it's been drifting apart, a channel's been opening between them. And with that channel, a current has developed, it goes around Antarctica. And and that current uh, basically puts, it, 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 it insulates and isolates Antarctica, it puts Antarctica in a deep freeze. Antarctica is drastically colder than the northern equivalents. And if you went to the South Pole, the temperatures there on the average year round are 50 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the North Pole. 
All this is because of an ocean current system. Now, if we go back and look at this curve again, you'll notice there is some oscillations going up and down. And we can look at those in greater detail. This is over 600,000 years, less than a million years. And during this period, we see what well, we see cold times, cold oscillations. Uh, in between those, we see warm oscillations. These are, these are ice ages and interglacial ages. And there's quite a number of these. And, and those too are caused by ocean currents. But before I mention that, to answer, get a little bit of the second level of my question, uh, if you look at this range for 600,000 years, now we're going to look at the, the, the temperature is related to CO2. And CO2 levels in part per million, if you go back for 600,000 years, they go, they go back and forth between 190 parts per million and 290 parts per million. 190 being cold, 290 being warm. So yesterday, just as an exercise, I checked on the parts per million for the present. 410 parts per million. Let's think about this, okay? Uh, we have the whole range comes here. Now, at present, in the last several decades, plus maybe a bit, it has gone from here to, let's see, at this scale, maybe a meter higher than the ceiling? Yeah. Think about that. It's gone up that much in a short period of time. And it's gone, it's gone up by more than the, the distance between warm and really, really cold in the last half million years. Um, so it has been bouncing up and down. And the cause there, and there's some arguing here and some uncertainties. But by and large, I think that those oscillations are again caused by ocean current systems. Uh, particularly in the North Atlantic, it's a little more confined. There's more uh, circulation in terms of patterns with the Arctic and so forth than there would be on the Pacific side of things. Uh, and what happens basically is some current, doesn't need to be a surface current, it could be a, a kilometer or two kilometers down, that is going this way because of some set of conditions turns that way. And that's all it takes, really, to change the climate enough for this to go from the one regime to the next. So again, it's ocean currents. Now, you might ask, how do they know this stuff? Where do they come up with this data? I mean, how do you, what evidence are you using to frame these, these conclusions? And the answer is, by and large, and particularly for the last several decades, the, the information comes from the bottom of the ocean. And I mean to say the deep ocean. We're not talking about that where just offshore where you might scuba dive. We're talking the deep ocean where the, where the ocean waters are four, six, maybe more kilometers deep. The bottom of the ocean has igneous bedrock formed in volcanism at the bottom of the ocean. But over that, depending on how old the bedrock is, there's an accumulation of sediment. And that sediment could add up to more than a kilometer. And that sediment in the deep ocean is ex almost exclusively microfossil sediments. There are lots of single-celled organisms that produce skeletons. They live up here, but when they die, the, the skeletons sink, and they have accumulated to enormous lengths. And what has happened in the last 50 years is there's been a couple of very key oceanographic shifts and programs associated with them, the Glomar Challenger and the Joides Resolution. And what these ships do is they drill, at, and they've been drilling, doing this for 50 years. They drill and they recover cores. Uh, this is uh, some cores that have just been pulled out and preliminary look soon after they come onto the floor of the ship. And there are the people on board the ship, and then there are the shore-based scientists that are associated with the crews. And I've been on, I've been a shore-based scientist on 11 of these cruises over the course of time. And so we publish the initial results, and then these things go into repositories. This is the one in Germany. And 
I told Kevin that I would stay within the screen, so I'm within the camera range. Are we doing fine? Okay, good. Uh, so this is in the repository. And scientists, again, such as me, can order pieces of this. I get, you know, a couple of cubic centimeters, and I process them, and I interpret pieces of Earth history. Uh, what I can interpret, and here's some of these cores. There are three of these cores right here, and I just want to show you these cores. Uh, this boundary right here, that's when a meteorite hit the Yucatan Peninsula, um, and that is the age of dinosaurs. This is post-dinosaurs. We like to think, well, the meteorite, the meteorite, the meteorite was the trigger mechanism. What the meteorite did was it set up some kind of a chemical change in the oceans. It apparently had an influence on uh, organism, carbonate organisms in the, in the water column, what we call planktonic. They were unable to make their skeletons. That changed the climate and the dinosaurs died. So the dinosaurs were not killed directly by the meteorites, but by through a, through a process. That's the current theory. So let's talk about these, these microscopic organisms that make up this microfossils. And what you're looking at here are the diatoms. Now the diatoms are, they're, they're, they're algae. They are photosynthetic. They are plants at the base of the food chain. They are beautiful, come in all kinds of shapes and, and whatnot. Um, this group, if you wanted to add up the biomass of all the organic, organic stuff in the world in a time, and for this figure I'm going to not include the bacteria, with Larry's permission, um, and if you were to add up all that biomass, this group makes up 20% of that. This is 20% of all the biomass of our planet. So they're important. And this is the coccolis. Now, I should say that diatoms, they have quartz skeletons, which we would see as sort of glass. They're glassy skeletons. And this is another algal group. This is the coccolis, otherwise known as the calcareous nanoplankton. Bit smaller, very intricate skeletons. These are made, these skeletons are made of calcite. And this group, and again, these numbers are sort of ad hoc. They're just, they're just approximate, so don't pin me down on this too much. But this group is about maybe 25, maybe 30 percent of the world's biomass. I mean to say that those two groups, the diatoms and the coccolis, are practically the, the base of the food chain in the oceans. About half the total biomass of the planet. They're important. And these are two of the key organisms that are single-celled but animals. These are the zooplankton that feed on the algae, uh, the foraminifera on your left and the radiolarians on your right. And yeah, it's really hard to pin down numbers, but they're probably something on the eight, five to eight percent of perhaps global biomass. So what we have here is we have four organism groups that have skeletons, and these four in the present and for some good portion of the geologic past add up to at least half the global biomass. Uh, again, diatoms, coccolis, plants, this is uh, uh, made of quartz, these are made of calcite, foraminifera, radiolaria, animals, these are made of calcite, these are made of quartz. The four, oh, and they're gorgeously beautiful. The, so these are the four most important uh, skeleton bearing, and most stuff in the oceans are skeleton bearing, uh, with the fossil record. This is the fifth most important group. Uh, it is a whole lot, it's a couple good notches below the ones we've seen. The ones we've seen, you know, add up to you know, four or five for the animals, 20% of biomass for the plants. Uh, this maybe adds up to most of a percent of global biomass. Doesn't sound like much, but I think all trees in the terrestrial environment add up to about the same amount. If you want to do a comparison kind of things. I would say they're important enough. The, di the diatoms and the calcareous nanoplankton, actually each one of these groups has enough scientists 
that there is a scientific society with specialized journals for that group. No such thing for pseudoflagellates. Pseudoflagellates right now, in terms of people who specialize in that, there's four or five in the world, me being one of them. Okay? So they're understudied. Uh, not enough is known about them. But they are not trivial. They are important in their own way. OK, so that's a little bit getting into what I study. What these are, they, they are algae. They're plants. They have beautiful geometric skeletons. They're made, the skeletons are made of quartz. Basically, they're, they're glass bars. They're something that, that we can make in a, in a, chemist, in a chemistry shop. Yeah. Uh, glass bars, they have a domal shape. And if you like to think about their configurations, think of the poles in a dome tent, with the, the tent itself being the, the, the outer boundary of the, of the soft portions of the cell. Yeah, I, I just want to point out, I mean, I can make glass in the chemistry lab. I can't make anything that gorgeous and on that small a scale. Well, not that small a scale. I, but the but glass, was, we can make, I mean, we know how to make glass and, uh, and how to make something out of pure quartz. That's a little more difficult, the fabrication. But I mean, I can make, you know, soda lime glass. That's fairly easy to do. But the quartz, uh, you got to, I mean, that's got a very high melting point. So, I mean, yet, what I'm saying is you're giving us too much credit Kevin, as chemists. When I was at, working on my PhD in Florida, I uh, was starting to talk about these things already. And so I walked into a chemistry shop. And they have, in a big school, they actually have people, chemists, a chemistry staff who make the glassware. And I, I showed some pictures. I said, can you make me one of these? I mean, it's made out of, they're hollow, skeletal elements, just like glass. Uh, the proportions are just like the glass you see in a chemistry shop. And he made me a couple of models for, for two general, which I use. I, I should have brought them with me, but, um, and I use them to this day. I gave him a fossil fish when it was all done. He was happy as a clam. Uh, but yeah, so that's what they look like. Yeah. How, pardon me, Kevin, how big were the models that he made? I'll bring them in. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Which is, I'd have to think about the, 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 the scale, but these are a thousand times bigger than the. The only really thing I can do with glass is make big pieces, expensive pieces, of that, small little tiny bits. I, that. I, I did that with a piece of glass in my lab yesterday too. Uh, so, so what I do then is I get these samples and I process them. And what I'm doing basically is I'm by processing, I'm concentrating the stuff that the glass, dissolving the rest, and making microscope slides and. Now my office is starting to get a little more cluttered. So that's what I do. Now, what I'd like to do from here is I, I say a little bit about my history here. I, 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 this is my 30th year. And in those 30 years, there are basically three more or less 10-year pieces to it. When I first came here, I was doing a lot of shore lab work for the ocean drilling program. And what I was doing was I was bringing students in, and I had students working with me on papers. I had nine students who um, co-authored papers in the initial scientific results of the ocean drilling program, and they're the only undergraduates in the history of the entire program that ever published there. Four of them uh, were first authors. Uh, I did that for 10 years, and sort of wore out, and was interested in, um, in uh, informal learning, so I you know, worked on a uh, science museum, solar system model, this and that. And I very abruptly went back to science. And that happened in 2008. Um, a colleague of mine at the University of Nebraska sent me some pictures. What happened was he was going through some drawers, and drawers for a, a student he had 10 years previously doing work on diatoms, happened to take some pictures of silk flagellates sitting in an envelope, and he looked at it and said, hey, Kevin might be interested in these. He sent them to me. And so I get some pictures. Now, the picture on the top is a picture of a genus called Cornua. Um, Cornua was described in 1928. Um, German drew um, three line drawings. And that's all that there is for the history of this. 
Uh, no pictures. This is the first picture that anybody has ever seen for this. Uh, it's, it's like it's sort of like a biologist going out in the, wo uh, in the woods and seeing a unicorn. What? I mean, I mean, I thought that was you know some freak or something. Okay, but there were several pictures there, and there are these other things, and these other things. Uh, yeah, I think they're so fragile, but they're not like anything I've ever seen before. It's not that they're new species. Yes, they're new species. Uh, actually, most, all three of these species are now named after students from here, believe it or not. Uh, but they're also a new genus. And what these were from was from, they were from Cretaceous beds. This is again late in the dinosaur era, uh, from northern Canada and some of the sundry elements, or some of the sundry uh, islands. Uh, the initial ones are from Horton River, but I got myself a sabbatical. I went to the University of Nebraska, started working on these, and no sooner than I arrived, I started getting emails from a guy in Poland. He was a PhD student. He actually, his major professor was the person I was studying with at the University of Nebraska. The scientific world is a very, very small world, <coughs> and he's sending me some pictures. <laughs> Can you send me some slides? Sure. You know, and we started working together. Uh, there's the three of us. And, and what we wound up doing, uh, well, amongst other things, uh, that is a new genus and new species, and I named it after Umpi, Umpi Oka, Umpi Anna. I can do that. I'm giving the name to it. Um, and what we wound up doing, cut to the short, several papers out of that one sabbatical, was uh, we wound up with two new genera, you just saw one of them, and you just saw the other one too, and 18 new species, four of those named after students who did work with me here, very good work, and I rewarded them. Uh, but out of that also, we got a new interpretation of Cretaceous subclassical evolution where there was no old interpretation. It was, the, it was the, finally, we had some idea what might have been going on in the early history of the group. Really. Neat stuff. But as the old Ronco um, advertisements used to say, but wait, there's more. Uh, I saw this thing. Now, this is a very rare, actually the first ever found in the Cretaceous double skeleton. Now, as I mentioned, silicoflagellates form dome shaped skeletons. But the bottoms of those domes can connect with another dome-shaped skeleton to form a double skeleton. They do this, they form this, and then they divide. It's part of the reproduction process. Uh, these are from the modern, and these are found, yeah, they're found fairly commonly in the modern, although nobody had bothered to publish any papers about this, almost nothing about this. And now, I've got one from the Cretaceous. Uh, there have not been very many fossils found. People have illustrated, hey, I found one of these without much clarification. I've got one here, but the one I've got is different. The corners have been rotated with respect to the, the other skeleton in what I call the Star of David configuration. And silicoflagellate double skeletons don't do that. They have the corners aligned. All the modern ones, virtually all the, 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 the fossil ones, have this configuration. I'm puzzling through this, and, and actually I was in a, uh, a, a teaching a short course in, in, in Poland and looked at some materials there. This would be in uh, 2010. And in the time just after the Cretaceous, I find another one of this type. So these things are there. What are they doing there? So what I did was I got a sabbatical 2012. Uh, doing several things, but one of the main tasks is learn more about double skeletons. And the best place to start is start with where you've got some more specimens. Started with the recent. I got into a conversation at a conference with a colleague in Japan and said, I'm looking for pictures of double skeletons. He said, Oh, I got, I got dozens of them. Go, what, what, how do you got that? He has students who are always doing, doing projects and they photograph everything they got and they photograph diatoms and subclasses and there's, and there's double skeletons in amongst there too. I said, well, how about if uh, how about if you and me and anybody else that has double skeletons, we're going to do a big paper. And we solicited double skeleton photographs from other colleagues. We wound up with a paper with 12 co-authors from nine countries on 
modern double skeletons. Neat. So 2014, I say, okay, we've now been picking up some pictures. There's pictures in the literature. Let's 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 do the the big paper on the fossil double skeletons. And I spent some time in Japan where they had a lot of materials to look at, and in, in Poland. And again, these are very rare, but I found a group of skeletons in the Star of David configuration, a group of skeletons in the corner line configuration, and, and the explanation here, it is a hypothesis, it's something that's still being, needs a lot to clear up. But my hypothesis is there was a group, the Silver Clouds had two groups, this one became extinct about 25, 30 million years ago, and then this group persists to the present, and that would account from my observation of these two odd silver flies of configurations. So, and that, by the way, is, is radical. I mean, that changes everything in terms of interpretation of early silver flies. And again, it's just, it's a work in progress. And, by the way, while working on double skeletons, a uh, graduate student um, in University of Nebraska, hey, this is neat what you're doing. He's great with computers, so we also developed computer models of some of these very early double skeletons for which we did not have actual double skeletons to look at, but we can figure out how they came together. Neat stuff. So, this is now where I'm embarked. What I, uh, in starting my work in the Fulbright and, and continuing on what years I have left. This is the Cretaceous silicoflagellate record uh, that is the end of the Cretaceous, the end of the dinosaurs. And what I want to do is do, by the way, this is the only group that per persisted. These became extinct at that time. Uh, I want to do the evolution of the rest of the story. And you might think that that's easy, but it isn't. Because, first of all, uh, the taxonomy is, is, is a mess. And the, the interrelationships with the, the, the transitional forms between this and that are hard to come by. And, and I'm getting a feeling for where some of that record might be, and I'm, and I'm starting to piece elements of that together. So for the Fulbright, what I did was I decided to take the 15 years above and the sediments above the end of the Cretaceous, so the first 15 years of the age of mammals, 15 million years, and, and usually in past work, including work I had done, you had one core, and you did that, and you talked about everything there, and you, uh, you did all kinds of neat stuff. I, and that is the old standard. Uh, in other disciplines, now there's a new standard, and it's time to bring silk flagellates up to that standard. I did five, the five best sites from the southern latitudes. This is then in where they would be located in the present in drilling. This is in the 58 million years ago where they were at that time and with plate motions and all that. And so I did these five holes at a much more detailed sample interval and with much better dating. Technology is much improved. I had a lot to learn. It was like graduate school all over again for me. Uh, and I linked these together and developed biostratigraphic systems and all kinds of stuff tied them all to show that history in that sense, while I'm also clearing up a lot of taxonomic, taxonomic and other issues. Uh, I uh, set up a new genus and found two new species. And let's just take a look at the, the, the new species. This is Dictyoca castellum. Castellum is Latin for fortress. And it's named, if you look at the, at the outer ring here, it, it looks like a medieval star fortress with the, with the interesting designs to clear the walls and with gunfire and so forth. Uh, and then the second one is Stephanoga fulbrightii, uh, which as Jason said, I named the species after my benefactor, William Fulbright. Uh, also, I just happened to see a double skeleton. It's not a very good specimen. It's got some debris on it, but there's another photograph for that record. Uh, so I did that while I'm also working my grand plan is again an evolutionary explanation for everything. And we're talking a dozen genera and 
other issues. Uh, one of the things in my samples, and I, and I knew that they were here because somebody else had seen a bit of this uh, and only a couple samples, so I did about 20 samples to show the record. This is, uh, there's a genus called the Viculopsis, it has two spines, it's a long record, um, became, uh, uh, it evolved, began about 50 million years ago, persisted to about 20 million years ago. And this is the three-sided forms from which that came from. And I was able to precisely show the transition, which is nice. Uh, so, and what I'm doing now, I've got the, the, the paper that I've shown here and here, that has just been uh, and submitted and has just been accepted about six weeks ago. The galleys came to me this weekend. I uh, had a few changes within the galleys and sent those back to the editor yesterday. Um, and I am currently working on a major paper on the evolution of this genus and some other things that we're working on. So that is, that is in four minutes, that's what I did for the Fulbright. I can give you the long version, but I don't think, I think what I'd like to do here is keep it very essential. Um, let me go back to this question. We've talked about it, and I've given you the first two levels. Uh, of course, the climate's changing because, because it always changes. Uh, the question is whether it's changing because of human influence. Yes, it is. Uh, it's it's taken take, take, take scientists 25 years to, to, to argue and, and cajole and think and, 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 and develop that consensus, and the consensus is developed. Not everybody likes it. But yes, we are changing the climate, and that we know. But let me give you the microorganism specialist's perspective. I, there's a third level that I want to give you, and it's not generally known, certainly in the lay world, even perhaps in, in large portions of the scientific realm. Um, so this is the marine microorganism specialist perspective. This is everything that lives in the ocean. Now it's whales and, and fish and all kinds of neat stuff. And remember, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, uh, and these numbers are educated guesses, but I would say that they add up to 90% of the biomass um, of the oceans. With the diatoms and the four, the four organism groups I showed you making up probably at least half of that. <clears throat> There's been some questions about where all the heat is going that goes up in the CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, it turns out that a lot of it is going into the oceans. And so there's a heat content. This is an energy numbers in the oceans. You can see that is increasing by a significant amount in the last 20 years. There's a lot of heat going into the oceans. And that heat uh, is caused by dissolved carbon dioxide. And associated with the, with the increasing carbon dioxide is an increase in what we call the acidity, what the scientists call a pH. And the pH, it goes from, it's a, it's a base to acidity, acidity scale. Uh, the lower numbers are more acid. And I'm not going to get into the chemistry in any great detail here. But what is happening is dissolved carbon dioxide is increasing, pH is decreasing. We are right here. The end of the century is going to be right there. And between here and there, some scientists, in, who I respect a great deal, are saying that the carbonate organisms that live in the water column are going to not be able to paint their skeletons between here and there, this century. Um, by the way, that is precisely what happened uh, associated, I think, with the dinosaur extinction of 65 million years ago. Again, it was chemical changes within the, within the ocean that precipitated the more, the more apocalyptic global event. Uh, here's the data. Uh, this curve here is atmospheric CO2. Now, I just want you to know that getting data from the ocean is a whole lot more difficult than getting data from, from the atmosphere. For an, at, for an atmosphere, you let a balloon go into the stratosphere. Piece of cake. 
For the ocean, it takes a lot of difficulty to get a data point from two kilometers down in the middle of the ocean. I mean, it takes a lot of money, technology, a ship, crew, all that. So the data doesn't go back as far. It only goes back 25 years. But this is the uh, dissolved CO2 in the ocean, and this is the PhD, pH going down. And this is a very famous cover, oceanography, 2009. The study here uh, is of some mollusks some, uh, that are, have, have shells. They're, they're juvenile shells that live planktonic, they're in the water column. Except that the pH has gone to a point where they can't make their shells. Their shells are dissolving as fast as they can make them. This is not good for these mollusks. And I have colleagues, um, my major professor studying Cocolis. Um, I'm a member of the Nanoplankton uh, uh, Association, Diatoms too. There's a Silicon Flagell Association, I'm a member, but it would be not be any people in the meeting. Um, I have people who study these things, and and you go to the meetings and over a beer, they drink beer too. Um, they'll tell you that they have serious concerns about whether these organisms are going to, with another tenth of a point pH, tenth of a point, we've already lost a tenth of a point in the last 20, 30 years, another tenth of a point pH, they don't think they're skeletons. These things will be making their skeletons anymore. And this is 25%, more or less, of the biomass in the oceans. What would be the ramifications of that, it, just in terms of the base of the food chain, not to mention that you're eliminating a lot of organisms that are taking the CO2 and producing the oxygen. I mean, who knows? We don't know. But it is something that we should be concerned about. Scientists are concerned about that, but you know, they can say it verbally, and that can be a little, I've seen a couple of, a couple of three or four little newspaper articles about the, uh, uh, which is, you know, last day and a half, and then it's lost, and it's out of people's minds. Um, it's, it, it's something for us to be concerned by. Uh, okay, so that is the science realm. Let's do the other end of it. Um, let's talk about a little bit about my travel. Now, first of all, if you want to see, I did have a daily photo blog. Get on my web page, it's in the links. Kevin's daily photo blog from Fulbright. Oftentimes, mobile photos each day. I pulled some here. A uh, little bit of time, well, I'll, I'll show a few things. I'm leaving, this is the Penn Air Station. I have my rotary cap. Thank you, Gina. Uh, I have my uh, uh, Bazinga t-shirt. And I have a book by James Mishner. Now, James Mishner used to write historical novels. They were all this thick. He picked some place, and I have found a copy of James Mishner's book on Poland, and that's my first thing is to read that book. Now, where I'm going is I'm going to Szczecin. Szczecin, again, northwestern uh, border of Poland. And let's understand a little bit about the history there. Now, first of all, Poland has an extremely interesting history. All of it is very interesting. But the last century is especially interesting. And let's just, uh, all this area here, all the area west of that line that I've just drawn, that is to say that the western third of modern day Poland is old Germany. And this is all what used to be known as Prussia. There are Teutonic Knights built some of the biggest castles in all of Europe. They're still there in this area here. Okay? So what happened? Well, here's the recent history. This is Poland in red in 1938. And what happened in 1939 is two things. Hitler came in this way, and he had already made pre-arrangements with Stalin to meet him here. So Stalin came in the other way. And so uh, Hitler, here's, here was, here's German boundary. He came and met the Russians there. They had a war. Uh, the Germans lost the war. The Russians came back uh, very angry. Uh, and they came to here and they said, oh, hey, this is our old boundary. This is our boundary between Russia and Poland. Really? Well, they've got the tanks. Uh, Mike can tell you about that. 
And uh, but we got all these poles over here. Well, there's a solution. The Russians say, we'll just take all these poles. We don't want them anyway. We're just going to we're going to tell the Germans for all this area to get up. We're going to evict them from these territories. And when these poles are going to leapfrog across there and occupy those areas. And so what you have in modern day Poland is you have a good portion that is, is old is old Germany. It's now Poland, it's forevermore going to be Poland. The Germans have no claim on this anymore. Uh, meanwhile, this is all this is all Belarusia or, or the Ukraine, it's not the Soviet Union anymore, although they're trying to get it back, I think. Um, so let's take some pictures of Szczecin. Now, here's the history of Szczecin. Szczecin is a shipbuilding um, city, so it and it built U-boats, and it was bombed badly. All the U-boat areas and, and the adjoining city areas pretty well destroyed. Uh, other bombs falling around the other areas. You do see these beautiful old German buildings are now sort of dispersed because it is not the, the old German city uh, does not survive intact. You see these, oops, uh, this is uh, the big old German water pump. These things are scattered around the city. Beautiful architecture. I loved it. Uh, by the way, so but there was a there was a there was a war fought. There was actually a battle of Szczecin was fought same week as the battle of Berlin. Berlin and Szczecin are very close together. This was a German city, and the Germans defended it, and the Russians came out and they and they pushed them out door by door. There is a building near my um, near my office. Here it is. Those are bullet holes, big caliber bullet holes. Across the street is an old uh, shopping mall. I'm sure the reason the shopping mall was there is all the city structure that was there has been destroyed during the war. And by the way, you can ask what happened there. Nobody can tell you because everybody who's there now, there's no memory of this. They weren't here when that happened. They came in afterwards. So it's an interesting history that way. It is a, a shipbuilding, it was a big shipbuilding area. Uh, when the wall came down, uh, now there's uh, globalization and more competition and less ships are now built in Szczecin. You are near to the Baltic Sea though. Uh, there is some history here. You wouldn't believe this, but that is the building where Catherine the Great was born. Catherine the Great, mid, mid 1700s, uh, Catherine the Great, a German uh, in Prussia, uh, uh, married the Tsar. Uh, probably, it's questionable exactly what happened, what she did with the, with the Tsar, but she took over, became Catherine the Great. Uh, that building has been considerably revised. I don't know what the damage was after, uh, after the war that they needed to cover it up that way, but I understand the original building is underneath that, believe it or not. Uh, the oldest movie theater is in Szczecin. Uh, this is a movie theater. It's been in business since 1907. Those of you who know your movie history, 1907, I mean, I mean, back in 1907, the movie would be a train coming at you. You go, oh, you know, and, and, and that'd be it. I mean, that was as sophisticated as it got. Uh, but I, heard, I had to go there because I love old stuff. I love old technology. I wanted to see these old projectors. I wanted to see those old silent movies. Uh, that's the projector they have now. Uh, uh, but it's still the environment. It's a very, very cozy kind of place. You can just imagine them seeing a train coming out. And statues, poles like statues. Uh, so on your right is the single most statued person in Poland, uh, John Paul II. Yeah. Every city uh, block probably has a statue of John Paul. Half joking, but Tomasz probably won't correct me. Uh, People argue about which is the which which is the best and which is the worst, and so forth. On your left, still in Szczecin, this is a. If you go into Europe, especially Eastern Europe, there are lots of very evocative monuments uh, and so forth. This is a monument, and it is set up to honor 16 kids, ages 16 to 24 who put it upon themselves to have a protest march 
in Szczechen against the Russians in 1980. Didn't end well for them. Uh, I've actually met a couple people who actually knew one another, these kids. Uh, these memories go back a long ways. Thanks a lot, Ray. Uh, Rachel. Uh, so, John Paul II, what he is looking at down the walk is, um, is the park. The statue here is the um, Monument of Polish Endeavor. And it is, it's got three eagles. This is the uh, monument to Poles past, Poles present, Poles future, reaching upwards. Beautiful. Um, the flowers here. Poles love flowers. Uh, they just they love flowers. Here's um this is a this is just a random flower shop. They're everywhere. They're oftentimes open 24 hours a day. Uh, there are in at least this area of Szczecin, there are more flower shops than there are grocery stores. And if, if you go to visit anybody for any excuse, you get a bunch of flowers to take with you. So lots of flowers. Uh, this is a scene right near my office. So down that road at Emma Vichkovichka uh, Ulitsa, I've come down on my tram. This is the tram going into town. My office is 50 meters to your left. Uh, not many bombs here. You have a lot of the original architecture. The, this this four-story kind of buildings here, this is basically the architecture of Europe. Those of you who have been to Europe, uh, especially uh, Western Europe, uh, that hasn't been destroyed by the war. You see a lot of this. Uh, the, the tram, the trams were wonderful. Uh, if I went to this tram station, a tram would be here within five minutes. It could take me pretty much anywhere. I could be anywhere in Szczecin in 20 minutes. Very good. By the way, these trams are Polish built and uh, the company come to builds these and supplies trams to most of Europe. I have an empty space here and I didn't know what to do with it. But I had lots of pictures. I love old architecture, the old, the old artistic wear. This is a fire hydrant uh, with nice big eyeballs and whatnot and nozzles and stuff like that. I do not know the year of it. Uh, there is a patent date, but I never got around looking it up. But you see, if you go to Europe, you go to Western Europe, or Eastern Europe particularly, you see these kinds of things around any corner. You walk around, whoa! And it, it's nice to develop. I have an eye for these. But there's just, there's just so many interesting surprises for the eye there. And this is true of Europe in general. But Eastern Europe uh, is well worth time. This is uh, Dr. Wong. I want to show you this picture, OK? This is in front of the geology building. Uh, in front of the geology building, there's the entrance there, are these great big, huge boulders uh, of showing some of the representative geology of the rocks in the surrounding area. There's three more on the other side of the walkway with some educational information about these. We need these in front of Folsom Hall. <laughs> I'm serious. I just a matter of finding them and getting the trucks, and we can do that. And that's not a big deal. We just need to get permission. Let's do it. OK. Uh, yeah, it's heavy, but you know, four of us, you know. Um, <laughs> So some pictures uh, of some of the places I visited. And again, I don't have time to show many, but I want to show a few. Uh, I definitely want to show a picture of, of Poznan. And I'm sorry, Helena Herzog can't make it today. She was the person who, who taught me what Polish I know. And I learned enough. I got by. I, 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 I don't claim to be fluent at it. Uh, Poznan was not uh, uh, destroyed much. Uh, so you've got a lot of the original uh, architecture here. The, the brickwork you see around, this is Europe, Europe in general. Very, very pretty. Uh, very well done. Very beautiful. If you're going to Eastern Europe, uh, pick your city, anyone, get a motel, any old city. Any old city. Every, most every city. Uh, Szczecin didn't have one of these because their old city was German. The Poles came in, they felt no nostalgia for that, so it wasn't rebuilt. But other Polish cities, have an old city, and this is the old city in Vashava. Again, uh, they pronounce W's in a V sound, and I, I now just automatically say Vashava, so I'll keep saying it. Vashava, Vashava, it's not Warsaw, it's Vashava in my mind. But beautiful, 
Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What you must know is that all of this has been rebuilt from scratch. The Germans destroyed everything. And I don't mean it was by bombing, it was by house to house fighting, there was some of that for sure. But the, but the, the Germans this wanted, they, they destroyed anything that might tug at a Polish heart. They wanted to destroy all Polish culture because there was going to be no Polish culture after, after they got established there. They took these buildings down and then they dug up the foundations. There would be no rebuilding. And the Poles have, over the years now, been rebuilding and they've done such a good job. You've got to go around and you see the patina. Patina takes a huge amount of time to make, hundreds of years. And they put the patina back there. I don't know how they did that. Uh, this monument here has this big pedestal. That pedestal, everything here was destroyed. That pedestal still survives. It's down here. So here's what it looks like. It's, it's now in pieces. And those are bullet holes all up and down the length. You can walk around, there's bullet holes every side you look at. It was, uh, it, and, and you can see pictures of what this all looked like after the war. It was, there was nothing left. Um, this is a good panorama. This is the kind of stuff that you see again in, in Warsaw. Uh, these kind of pictures are great. Uh, but what you need to do is, is go into the alleys, and, and there's all kinds of beautiful shops and beautiful things. This is an amber shop in just an alley. Uh, the, uh, this is Adama Mieczkiewicza, who is the second most statued person in Poland. He is the poet laureate for uh, Poland and Lithuania. Uh, and so here's a statue, and I got a, a magnification here. It's not a statue. I just, I just, I just, I just love the beautiful wrought ironwork there, and you see a lot of that in in Eastern Europe. This is the third most statued person in Poland, and he is a scientist. Copernicus. Copernicus. Uh, this is in Warsaw. This is in Turun. He was born in Turun. Uh, the statue survived the war uh, because uh, the Germans uh, got, uh, uh, thought that he was German, not Polish, and so they didn't destroy the statue. Uh, and, and, and you can, I, oh, by the way, there's a solar system all around it, too. Not as good as ours, though. Uh, I was there for a couple of um, Fulbright functions. They wined and dined us. This is uh, the ambassador to, American ambassador to Poland's uh, residence. It's a uh, fairly, fairly nice pile of bricks. Uh, the ambassador there, um, Paul, Paul, I, I'm thinking Paul Davis, but I've got it wrong now, I know. Uh, a bomb appointee, but still there. Uh, again, the Poles and Americans have a long-standing relationship, going way back to our American Revolution. Uh, Poles came to America, helped us get situated, and took the idea of a constitution back to, uh, back to Poland, uh, declared themselves independent, we've got a constitution, it's early in the 1790s, and Catherine the Great said, no you don't. Uh, long story, short ending, they were occupied by Poland and uh, Germany and Austria until after World War I. Uh, but here's a monument to Yerzy Washington. And here, this is Huberta Hubera Square. And I have seen monuments, parks dedicated to Herbert Hoover in three cities. What happened here after World War I, uh, there was a huge famine in Poland. And Herbert Hoover uh, came and, and, and administered uh, food going to Poland. He saved the lives of many people. <coughs> and it's deeply appreciated, you will, I'm, I'm sure, see more monuments to Herbert Hoover in Poland than you'll ever see in the United States. Uh, show a few people. I do have some ro rotary uh, people here. This is the Rotary Club, my other Rotary Club. And it's, a, it's the uh, Stetchen International Club. It, uh, most of it mostly Poles, but it speaks as English. Uh, I got along well there. Uh, this is me as Santa Claus at the Rotary Christmas party. Uh, the, uh, I work with the Ocean Army Department and the Geology Department. 
um, had good strong connections in both. This is lunch with some of the uh, of the grad students in the oceanography end of things. Uh, I was mentioning to a few people earlier, we could, you know, with those of you getting an undergraduate student with a degree here, you're looking to go someplace else, you might consider this place. Uh, it is, all the students there is quite international. I think more than half the students are, uh, are from wherever. Uh, this student who I've now co-authored a paper with is first author. He's from Turkey, Spain, Poland, myself, and China. Uh, this is another group. These are Chinese students. Uh, Jin Pong here, right across from me, he and I are publishing a paper on, uh, he's first author, on uh, microfossils from the Challenger Deep, deepest point, point in the ocean anywhere. Um, and one of the things I did while I was there, this is my last slide, uh, was Planet Head Day is coming here, and I said, well, I, I, I really need to participate in this. I, I do this every year. Uh, but I need to get my head shaved, I need to get opinions of the planet. And a couple of Rotary buddies uh, said, yeah, we can do that for you. And we set up, they just, just installed a new geology museum. And so I made, got permission that we could set up there. And uh, again, it's just all informal. And the place filled up. No advertising at all. This is just the people who, who stood around for a photograph. We had maybe three, four times that many people. And this is, you know, just me getting my head shaved. And, uh, and they said... Was that, was that their first Planet Head Day in Poland? That was the first time I got my head shaved. The first Planet Head Day in Poland is next month. Oh, okay. March 10th, and you're International right. Planet Head Day. Uh, it was going to be going on there and here at the same time. So it'll be 10 o'clock local time here, uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon local time there. What's going to happen? I will go there. I'll give the introduction and give the uh, give the introduction in English. Video going back and forth. Tomasz Herzog is going to be our spokeshead here. He will. Uh, while I'm getting my head shaved, he'll be getting his head shaved. Again. 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 Really. And and he will give the introduction in Polish. Uh, and and I think it's going to be the start of something something good. They they really they really think that this might get picked up by other places in, in Europe as well. Um, so that is the gist, and I've, I've gone very very quickly. I, I could show you much more of the science, much more of the everything else. Um, we I promised an hour. We've done more than that. Uh, so I'll open the floor to any questions. We can talk about Fulbright. We can talk about science. We can talk about Poland, and I'll do the best I can. Thank you. Questions? Got to be some. <coughs> or not. You again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of a dopey question. You're not going to be taking one of my classes someday, are you? No. no Good. Good. Yeah. No. <laughs> Why don't you take one of my classes? It's a good question. Yeah, I'm, I'm easy like a Sunday morning. Really. You know, like a Sunday. Anyway, this is kind of a dumb question. It's a chemistry-based question. But I look at those beautiful slides of the, the, the silica flatulence. And you know, the first thing the chemist says is what's in it. And I know they're mostly quartz. It's glass, yeah. Yeah. But are there trace elements in there? I mean, like for instance, lanthanides and things like that. And could we develop, I mean, could there, this is just really dumb, but is there a way to get at the trace element composition. Uh, maybe. And, I mean, I don't think it would be easy. I mean, I'm thinking of, there, there's one <coughs> or two techniques I'm thinking of, and then I'm thinking, not you idiot, why destroy such a beautiful specimen just to get a list of, you know, 14 or 15 trace elements? That's how scientists get their data, you know? But uh, never mind that. The, um, yes, the problem, the problem, that we have is there's not enough specialists. We're hard enough answering the big issues and then trying to get somebody to get the elemental work. Um, the uh, and would it go anywhere? I mean, would it be useful to do that? And I'm thinking, would that give us some kind of more insight on ocean chemistry? Well, I, like I don't think that the it's not like the um, 
the ice cores where you actually can get, well actually I will tell you that, that most of the climate information we get uh, comes from um, uh, stable isotopes, mostly of the carbonate, mostly of the foraminifera, but most of that, you know, those, those curves you see for climate, that does come from usually not the silicious end, but from the carbonate groups, um, and we do get that precise kind of information. The, the oxygen 1816, is that what you use as a proxy? And uh, Dave Putnam's son yeah. does a bit of that. We yeah. about, heard talk about that some while ago. That's, that's the big deal. Uh, not so much, uh, there, people do some, some work with the diatoms, but the uh, diatoms don't preserve the stable isotopes, the isotopes the way the carbonate fossils do. Really? There are a whole bunch of geologists doing this research. Really? They analyze the microfossils, they analyze the sediments, not just for trace elements, and also for isotopes. Yes. Okay. Much of the research there. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that's a lot of what we're doing is, 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 is is figuring these things in the in the environmental sense. Uh, question. Can you grow these in the lab? And can you get them to reproduce and divide like that and grow those double skeletons? You can. Actually, there's a real big problem with the uh, between the paleontologists and the biologists. The biologists do grow these things. And the skeletons they're all freaks and they're doing all kinds of weird stuff. And then they're trying to draw conclusions from that in terms of, 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 of the history of skeletal design. And they don't know what they're doing. I actually went to a conference in, in August where I outlined the problem here. And this is, this is to a phycological audience trying to explain how badly wrong the phycologists are. Um, and I have one of the projects I'm working on now is is they asked me to write a paper to summarize the sococlodulus and the modern and some of the issues there. So that's one of the projects I'm doing there. But uh, they can grow them uh, in petri dishes. These are diatoms and sococlodulus, but they're not happy. They, uh, the variability of the skeletons are all over the place. It's really, really hard um, to, again, these things live in a marine realm and in that marine realm, you know, we really don't know. And by the way, the difference between being in the water 10 meters down and, and 25 meters down, the chemistry varies. And actually the, uh, uh, the light, the, the chlorophyll that they react to varies because, because 25 kilo, uh, uh, meters down, the, the spectrum of light that these things are, are seeing, uh, portions of that is, is eliminated by the transit through the water. And we know so little about that. And the, the business of trying to understand how these things work in the oceans, and, and keep in mind, this is getting to be a very, this is going to be a very, very key part in terms of, of what's going on in our world, world environmentally in the next couple, three, four decades maybe. And yet, when it comes to the ocean realm, and the ocean realm is really the most important place. That's where all the heat is. That's where, that's where the, the uh, environment there, whereas our environment where things live are basically from ground level to, uh, to a couple, three meters down. There's a bird. Sorry about that. And uh, in the ocean, the, the, the sea level all the way down to kilometers down. It's a lot more, it's a lot more complicated, and we know very little about what's going on. Getting data uh, two kilometers down, uh, middle of the ocean, it takes a ship. And, and there aren't many ships doing that. And so the data is very hard. I think on the next slide there's an abbreviation. Um, and no, or other way, I guess. This is. Meter, yeah. Is that meters below the. That's meters below sea, sea floor. So that's 200 meters down from the, from the bottom of the ocean. So that's 280 meters down, 300 meters down, uh, 570 meters down. So that gives you the idea of the drilling depths and that, they're, that they're drilling to to get these things. It's, it's, there's two ships in the past, and now it's, uh, 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 one of those ships still doing this thing is a new ship that's been uh, has now entered the arena. Uh, but these deep ocean drill ships, and by the way, that's another thing. Uh, you know, graduate students. And I, I missed my chance, and again, my group is not so terribly important. If I was a diatomist, I probably would have been aboard that ship any number of times. 
but uh, graduate students, I'm working with a graduate student in Poland, and we just filled out the forms to, to, to for her, her first uh, demotion uh, uh, experience. It might be as a shore, lab, shore person, or it might be as a lab, a shore, a lab scientist. A shore scientist or a chipboard scientist, I should say. Any other questions? And there's there's so much there to be learned. And and you know those I see some students here. You know what you're learning here is this much compared to what is out there, which is only this much to what we need to know in terms of environmental change. You know um, we have possible catastrophic changes environmentally happening in the next several decades, perhaps. I mean, if, if those, if those coccoliths go belly up, and they might, I got colleagues that say they think they will, 20, 30, 40 years from now, then, I mean, we're gonna survive, but there's a lot in the world that relies on them that won't. And, and A, we don't know very much about it. We have a whole lot more to learn. And of course, we also have the problem that a lot of people, if they don't know about them, they do, they say, that doesn't sound right, that's fake news. And we, we, we as scientists need to communicate. Uh, this is why we're here is, and, and, and doing things like building solar system models and so forth to, to reach out and get people excited in science and so forth. And we are, we're working very hard to do as good a job as we can, but we're not working good, we're not getting enough done. The world is changing quicker than we can train the next generations of scientists to be able to understand this better. And there is so much that we don't know. I get students coming and saying, oh, I want to be an astronomer, I want to study whales. And I say, well, the, the, the smaller they are, the least you know about, the less you know about them, the more important they are. That's, that's the rule. Everybody wants to study that that they can see, and, and those things are those things are overstudied. Meanwhile, there's things that are really, really important of which we know very, very little. Well, I've got a thank you. Any other questions at all? And I'm done. <laughs>